Good morning. The Lord be with you. Amen. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Uh, for those of you visiting with us, perhaps for the first time, my name is Pastor David Mummins. Welcome to St. Paul's. We're glad to see you here on this wonderful Sunday morning. Uh, so I'm going to be honest, I was entirely surprised by the snow this morning. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, and so there's some, still some folks trickling in here, so probably because we were all surprised by the snow this morning. Um, anyway, a couple of quick announcements before we start our service today. By a couple, I mean we have a few to go through. Uh, first of all, today is the last day of February, which means it's our Noisy Collection Sunday. So in the back is our little spittoon uh, for our Noisy Collection, if you have your coins with you. Uh, this quarter's project is the backpack project over at the school, uh, which helps provide children who don't get regular meals um, a backpack full of food to take home for the weekend. Um, so that is where we're raising funds for for this quarter. Again, that's there in the back next to the offering basket. Uh, secondly, inside your service folder is a pink form. Um, that's for Easter lilies. Um, it's that time of year because Easter is in like four weeks. Um, if you'd like to order an Easter lily to put up here in the front of the church for Easter Sunday, please fill that form out and get it back to the church office um, so we can get those ordered in time. Um, also, uh, it is, it's still the season of Lent. Um, Lent continues this Wednesday night at 6.30 as we're working through our series, Return to the Lord, talking about God calling us back um, uh, calling us back in repentance, we spend this time looking at ourselves, at our sinfulness, and seeing Jesus, um, Jesus on the cross. So please join us Wednesday night at 6.30 here at the church as we continue our, our Lenten series. Um, also, um, our youth group, um, our, our spa youth group, is um, starting a new fundraiser. They're selling bread braids. Um, and new to the bread braids this time around is you can buy them online um, as well. So if you have a, a, a youth person uh, that you know of and you'd like to purchase a bread braid, please Go and see them. I will be posting on the church Facebook page a link to a, a store to purchase bread braids from. However, um, the youth group would prefer if you would contact one of them individually because there's some kind of contest going on. I think the winner gets ice cream from Oak Station, and it wouldn't be fair if everybody just purchased it from the church page because then I would win and get to go to Oak Station. Uh, so please uh, see one of the youth group um, members to, to get your bread braids um, as well. Oh, the announcement in the back, yes. Yep, so uh, the, the youth might be competing for your, for your attention as you're leaving church today um, trying to get those bread braids. Um, so those will be available in the back following the service day. And again, I'll post it on the, uh, the Facebook tomorrow afternoon. Um, uh, all right, so one last announcement then. Uh, we've been, as, as, as church leaders, we've been talking about this whole experience of, of COVID and our COVID restrictions and seeing how th uh, things seem to be improving generally. Uh, we are, are considering reinstituting our fellowship hour following our service, and so we'd like to start the process of, of having that. Um, there's a whole big announcement of it in your service folder. I encourage you to read through it, um, but if you would like to serve fellowship or if you would like to not serve fellowship, we're trying to update the list of fellowship hosts. Uh, please contact the church office about that as well. Okay, I think, <laughs> I think that's all the announcements I have for this morning. Quite a few of them. Um, just read the announcements in your service folder. They're all printed there as well. Our service today is going to be based off of our gospel reading from Mark. We're going to talk about this, this, uh, this famous phrase of deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. And what does it mean to be ashamed of Jesus? And we'll spend some time unpacking that this morning. Um, our service is available on our, inter on our website, stpaulsmemorals.org. You can follow along. Otherwise, it's Divine Service Setting 4. We'll start by singing our opening hymn number 722, Lord, Take My Hand and Lead Me. I pray the Lord's blessing on your worship today. <laughs>
Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth? If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, Forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise for your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our intro today is taken from Psalm 115 and Psalm 25. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. We will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Glory, Glory be, be to, to the, the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was, was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and, and will, will be, be forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all the adversities that may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Our first reading today comes from Genesis chapter 17, starting at verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall now be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts 
through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, although perhaps for a good person one might dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. Others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter, and he said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him a crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? What can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to you O Christ. Christ. We confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in, in God, God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in, and in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we join in singing our next hymn number 708, Lord, Thee I Love With All My Heart. Thank you. 
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who loved you with his very life. Amen. God's Word is, is such an important part of who we are as, as Christians, as, as humans. Uh, in the Bible, uh, we read the whole story of salvation. We read about God's plans to, to save us from our own sins and the punishments that we've earned because of them. We, we read about the love of God, how, how it's so vast and, and so great that he sends his only son to save us. The Bible is a book. It's, it's full of wisdom. It's full of hope. It encourages. It lifts us up. It strengthens our faith. It causes us to, to desire to, to be better people, to live better lives in a way that, that pleases God, but also in a way that serves those that God has placed around us. But of all of the things that the Bible is, uh, one of the phrases the Bible uses to describe itself is not one that we often say. The Bible is a two-edged sword. Now, recently, I've been enjoying uh, blacksmithing competitions on the interwebs, and, and one thing that I've learned is the fastest way to lose a blacksmithing competition is to make a sword that hurts the user. A sword has a purpose, but it's not to hurt you. And God's word is a two-edged sword. It's sharp enough to separate bone from marrow. But a weapon, a sword even, the word of God used improperly, can cause serious damage to yourself. And that should be avoided. Our passage today, taken from the Gospel of St. Mark, is a two-edged sword, to be sure. This passage is a beautiful work of art. Yet the words spoken by the Son of God separate bone from marrow, and used improperly, they can damage us. This passage is so, so fascinating in all that takes place that we don't have time to unpack all of the details, and it's hard to catch and see everything that's going on here in this passage. But we're going to try. So what I want to do is let's, let's walk through it quickly at first to, to get a sense of where we are in the gospel, kind of big picture stuff. And then specifically today, I want to take a close look at, at St. Peter, um, the leader, the spokesman, and the disciples, however you want to call him, uh, because he does some important stuff. And finally, we'll see how St. Peter looks an awful lot like we do and see how we fit in this text today as well. If you'd like to, you can follow along in the back of your bulletins, or your Bibles, if you have them with you, your phones, I suppose. Uh, we're in Mark chapter 8, so let's dive in. So our gospel text opens up with this phrase, um, Jesus leads his disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is a notable town. We know where it is. The archaeologists have found its physical remains. But it's notable for its temples to two pagan gods. The first one is Pan. You can look up Pan later if you would like. He is a goat. Uh, and then the second one we'll talk about in a minute. 
So Jesus takes his disciples outside of the promised land. They, they leave Israel to this prominent city where they actually worship Caesar as the second god. So we have Pan the goat, and then Caesar is being worshipped like a god here in this place. And then Jesus goes amidst these, these false gods, and he asks them this familiar question. Who do the people say that I am? And in this location, in Caesarea Philippi, it's like Jesus is saying, do they, do they see me like Caesar, like a man who claims to have some kind of divine lineage? Are they worshiping me as just a dude who's ascended into godhood? Or perhaps do they, do they see me like like Pan, like a mythical half-goat kind of thing. Who does the crowd say that I am? And so the disciples, they respond again with familiar words. Well, they say that you are a prophet, perhaps Elijah, perhaps John the Baptist, perhaps a different prophet. Remember from a few weeks ago that Elijah was taken into heaven in a chariot of fire, and so he didn't die. And so maybe the crowd thought, well, maybe he's come back. Then Jesus takes it amidst all of these, these talks about prophets, about Caesar being there, about this, about Pan. And then he takes this question and he makes it hit home, looking them square in the eyes, and he says, what about you? Where do I rank in your life? Do you think that I'm a prophet like the crowd does? Do you think I've risen to godhood like Caesar has? Or do you think that I'm something as, as silly as Pan? Who do you say that I am? And here we have Peter's very bold and very clear confession. You are the Christ. You are the chosen one. You are the Messiah. You are the one that God has sent to save us from our sins. And Peter gives the correct answer because Jesus is. After this moment, they're standing by these temples. Jesus takes his 12 disciples, and he takes them away from the crowd, pulls them aside privately because he wants to explain what Peter's words actually mean. And so he starts going through scriptures and showing them exactly what it means that Jesus is the Messiah, as Peter rightly said. Peter was right, and now Jesus is going to show what that looks like, how that's going to play out in real life in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. So Jesus is going to be treated poorly. He's going to be hauled before trials. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be rejected by the chief priests, the scribes, the teachers of the law, all of those powers that are there. And then he's going to be killed. He's going to suffer. He's going to die because that's what the Messiah needs to do. And then three days later, he's going to rise from the dead. And then Mark includes this detail in our text. Jesus tells them this plainly. He's not mincing words. He's not using metaphors. He's not using parables. Jesus says, you know that I am the Messiah, as Peter has confessed. This is what's going to happen. And Peter, well, <laughs> Peter doesn't like it. Peter, who just moments before, amidst all of the paganism, amidst all of these competing ideas of who Jesus is, who boldly makes confession, is like, no, that's not what's going to happen. Peter rejects the work of the Messiah. He doesn't like the plan, and so he, he pulls Jesus aside, says, to him, hey, Jesus, can I talk to you a second private? Jesus is like, yeah, sure, Peter, what's up? And then Peter rebukes him. This is an important word. This is the same word for rebuke that Mark uses to describe Jesus' actions with demons when Jesus rebukes the demons. No, I won't allow it, Jesus. You're not going to go through with this. You are too important to die. I will do everything in my power to keep you from falling into the hands of wicked men, to keep you from death. And as we learn later, Peter gets a sword. And Jesus, in this experience, he turns and he sees the other disciples sitting there. I like to think awkwardly because I would have been awkward out in that situation. We see Jesus turning and then he, he, he sees the disciples watching Peter rebuke him. And Jesus, he, he turns the tables. And he, again, the same word, rebukes Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he says. You don't know what you're saying. You're not thinking the way that God thinks you're not wanting the things that God wants done. You're thinking in earthly terms. I just told you God's plan. I know how to do God's plan. 
But your plan, Peter, that's what the devil wants. Your plan would prevent me from doing God's work, from preventing me from doing the work that I came to do, that I just told you I'm going to go and do. Get behind me, follow me, and I will do what needs to be done. Then after this rebuke of the man who just confessed him, Jesus calls the whole crowd over. This is important, he says. Everybody pay attention to this. If you want to follow me, as Peter is standing there following Jesus, if you want to follow me, deny the things that you want, reject your ideas of how it's supposed to work, pick up your cross as I'm picking up mine, and follow me. Following me, following my cross to my death. Pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Jesus continues, What good is it to be rich, but to spend your eternity away from God's presence? Spoiler, it's not good. What could you give to buy your salvation? Spoiler, God owns everything, nothing. If you're embarrassed of me, if you're ashamed of me and the things that I have to do, and I like to think at this moment that Jesus turns and he looks at Peter, who's standing there right behind him. If you're ashamed of me in the midst of this adulterous and sinful generation that worships half goat men and worships your kings as God, if you're ashamed of me in the midst of this, then I am ashamed of you. And I will be when I come back with my legions of angels on the last day. I can only imagine what was going through the mind of Peter as he's standing there behind Jesus at this moment. So ends our reading. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This passage in Mark, this, these few short verses that we have here, goes from zero to 100 real quick. And it causes us to walk away going, <laughs> What just happened here? One moment, Peter is, is boldly confessing, Jesus, you are the Christ, you're the Messiah. The next moment, Peter, you're Satan, get behind me. And then uh, next moment after that, he's following Jesus, carrying his own cross. There is a lot here in these few short verses in Mark chapter 8. But remember how I said that this passage is a double-edged sword. Here's what I mean. The words of Jesus Christ in verse 38 absolutely terrified me when I was a young man. To remind you what it says, Jesus says in verse 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory by his Father with the holy angels. And when I read this passage as a young man, I thought of all of the times where I wasn't Peter. All of the times where I was not bold to make confession, all of the times in my life when I was ashamed to say I was Christian. Specifically one event. I remember my first day of high school, my first class as a, as a freshman. I had previously gone to a Lutheran day school all the way through eighth grade. My class had like eight people in it. Um, and now when I got to high school, there were more than 200 people in my class. And it was quite the, the culture shock for this poor little Lutheran eighth grader. I didn't really know anybody around me, um, and so I went and I took my seat, trying to hide there in the back of the classroom, as I was very shy. And then someone came, I have no idea who this person is, and I still don't remember who this person is. And they came down and they sat down next to me, and they started to strike up a conversation, like normal people would do in that kind of situation. They were like, hey, I, I don't recognize you. Are you new to the area? And I said, no, I've lived here most of my life. Um, I actually just went to, to St. John's. That's probably why you don't know me. Oh, so you're a Christian then, they asked. And my heart sank. My heart raced and sank somewhat at the same time. Here was my chance. I, I get to be Peter. I get to make a bold confession in the midst of an adulterous and sinful generation. I get to be Peter standing before the idols of Caesar and Pan to, to look and, 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 and to say, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. But all that I could muster as a 14-year-old frightened boy was to barely nod my head and squeak out, yes? Oh, they said, sensing my very obvious and visible discomfort. Okay, that was it. That was my confession before this adulterous generation, this silent cop-out of a frightened 14-year-old high school kid, worried what some other 14-year-old kid would think about me. 
on my first day of my first class in high school in little old Portage, Wisconsin. Not quite the same thing as standing in front of a pagan temple in Caesarea Philippi. But this passage from Mark has always haunted me, always there in the back of my mind. If I was ashamed to say I was a Christian there, would God be ashamed of me when he returned? Would God mock me when he comes back, adding insult to injury and then condemn me for my lack of confession? Isn't that what Jesus says here in this passage? If you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you when I come back on the last day with the angels. Like I said, this passage is a two-edged sword indeed. Enough about me, though. What about you? Where do you fall in your own personal life on the spectrum of Peter, as you will? Are you, or have you been, as I was, timid and even ashamed about Christ? Was there a moment in your life, a moment when you could boldly stand up like Peter and say, yes, he is the Christ, but you end up just kind of pulling behind Jesus and saying, but not really, I don't really want to be where you're going. Was there a moment when you denied being a Christian, when you denied some aspect of your faith, when you softened the things that you believe, when you changed the teachings of Scripture to make yourself more likable, more, a little easier for those around you to accept? Were you like Peter after Jesus was arrested when Peter says three times, I don't know the man, calling curses upon himself, I swear I don't know the man. As Peter stands there ashamed in a courtyard, unwilling to talk to a young servant girl about his faith. Is Jesus ashamed of you? Is Jesus ashamed of me? Is Jesus ashamed of St. Peter? The words of Mark chapter 8, there's a lot to unpack. And this text is a sword that cuts deep. And it shows our sinful doubts. It shows our, our sinful unbelief. It shows our, our sinful cowardice in disowning Jesus Christ. It shows us that, yes, there are times when I, when we, when you are ashamed of Jesus Christ. So where does that leave us? Are we doomed? Like my young self thought, what about us? It is critically important for us to take the words of Christ seriously, to fear the two-edged sword, if you will. However, these aren't the only words in this passage. The sword of the Spirit, the word of God, is more than just one verse. And Jesus wants to see the focus of our lives the focus of Peter's life needs to be on what matters more than anything else. It needs to be on the cross of Christ. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow me. Our focus needs to be on Jesus, on his death, and on his resurrection. When we read scripture, when the sword cuts us, it draws us closer to Jesus. It confronts us with our sins and then pushes us to the cross. It causes us to deny who we are, to deny our sinful, sinfulness, to repent of our sinfulness and look to the one who took up his cross for you. Look to the one who bore the cross for you. Look to the one who endured the shame of the cross on your behalf. It's Lent now. It's going to be Lent for like another four weeks or so. And in that, we spend this time focusing on our sins. And yes, this is true, this is healthy, but we don't stop looking only at me. The focusing on our own sinfulness brings us to the, fit, to the feet of Jesus when we confess, yes, Lord, I am sinful. Yes, Lord, I haven't been the witness that you want. I've, I've sinned against you. Please forgive me for my sins. O oh Lord, have mercy. O oh Christ, have mercy. O oh Lord, have mercy. And the miracle of Mark chapter 8, and the miracle of the gospel, is Jesus does. 
Jesus dies for those who are ashamed of him. Or as Paul says in Romans in our text today, Jesus dies for even his enemies. And we see this all over the gospel. Jesus doesn't kick Peter out. He doesn't say, no, Peter, your plan's wrong. I won't allow it. Get away from me, Peter. That's not what he does. Rather, he invites Peter to follow him, to focus on the cross, to see with his own eyes what Jesus is going to do, how he's going to die for Peter's forgiveness, how he's going to die for your forgiveness. Jesus lays it all out open for us in this passage, how he must go to the cross for a purpose. He must suffer, die for a purpose to forgive us from our sinful unbelief, to forgive us from our sins. Jesus goes and dies and rises to take away your guilt, to take away your iniquities, to take away your shame. Jesus goes to do these things. He picks up his cross, denies himself, and saves you. After the resurrection, Peter is forever changed. His sins are forgiven. Jesus Christ comes and restores him, asks him three times if you love me, for each of the, one for each of the times that he was denied. And then Peter boldly goes and proclaims Christ. And legend has that Peter was crucified. He picked up his cross and followed Jesus even to his own death. For us, though, our faith in Christ will be just as rewarded as Peter's was. Your sins are just as forgiven, your faith just as strengthened, your witness just as emboldened. Your hope will be fulfilled. Jesus Christ came to take your sins because we can't bear their shame. Jesus came because we're broken, because we're like Peter. And now we also, like Peter, boldly confess who Jesus is. So when you look back at your life, at that very first day of your very first class, of your very first time in high school, or when you look forward to the days and times and years to come, we don't look as our world looks. We don't look as, as Peter once saw. We look with eyes of Christ, who has forgiven us, who picks up his cross and invites us to follow him. We look for the one who's going to come again with his angels, not to condemn us, but to take us to his side in his kingdom. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds forever in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise for prayer. In our prayers today, we're going to remember Paige, who was diagnosed with cancer. We're also going to give thanks for the baptism of Jacob, of Jacob Zink, who was baptized yesterday, um, as we welcome him into God's family. Let us pray. O oh Lord, in these last Lenten days, set our minds on your things rather than the things of man. We might deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow your Son through this life into the joys of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh Lord, you have given your church the joy of proclaiming the truth, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that we might be justified by his blood and saved from your wrath over our sins. Be with us all. Grant all pastors the gifts of your spirit to preach and teach this truth boldly and faithfully and help us in our personal lives to confess it boldly in word and deed. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh Lord God, keep us from being ashamed of the Son of Man when we face persecution for his name in this world, that he might not be ashamed of us when he comes in glory with his angels. Be, be near to all of those who are facing martyrdom for Christ. Sustain them unto the end that they might be crowned with the crown of victory and life before you. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, since all kingships belong to you, and since you rule over all nations, we pray that you, would, that you would bless Joe, our president, and all of those who govern us in your stead, that they might be ruled wisely in accordance with your will. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, through your Holy Spirit, pour out your love into the hearts of all, of all of those who suffer in our midst, that their sufferings might produce endurance, endurance character, and character hope, and a hope that will not put them to shame. Be with all of those on the prayer list of this congregation. Be with Paige, who has been recently diagnosed with cancer, and those who name before you in our hearts.
grant them health and healing in accordance with your most perfect will, and sustain them in all of their trials and tribulations. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, at your table, the afflicted eat the body and blood of our Savior and are satisfied. Through our afflictions, deepen our hunger for this table, that we might eat and drink and be satisfied by Christ's saving life. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, as we remember with thanksgiving the multitude of nations that rejoice in heaven before you with their father Abraham, we pray that you would sustain all of us in that same justifying faith, that as his offspring we might share in his everlasting covenant which you made with him. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, we give you thanks that you have preserved and enlarged your family. We give you thanks that you have brought Jacob Zinc into, into your family through the waters of holy baptism. Bless and sustain him in this life and secure his faith for the life to come. Lord, in your mercy. All of these things, whatever else that you know that we need, grant to us, Father, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. For those of you joining us online, we thank you for worshiping us with us this morning. I pray that the Lord would bless and preserve your coming and going from this time forward and forevermore. Amen. For those of us gathered